Good morning. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to welcome you to this service of worship at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We know that God is here with us in this place, and so truly there is no better place to be this morning. I have a few announcements for you as we're getting started. The first is that if you are new here or you're relatively new here, um, we would love the chance to get to know you a little bit more and connect with you. So you'll see in the pew rack in front of you, there's a blue and green connect card. If you would, fill that out. There you can let us know um, how we might be able to get in touch with you and if there's anything that you're interested in learning more about. And you can just place that in the offering plate when it comes around later on in the service. We're also all still getting to know one another, and so if you would, there's some name tags that are in your pews on the sides. If you want to put on a name tag so that we can be calling each other by name and you can have that nice visual reminder, even maybe of people that you've already met. This coming Saturday, we have a fun activity for kids and youth and really anyone, anyone of any age, called Surfing with the Spirit. Um, these are surf lessons with your church family. Um, there's still time to sign up for that. The details are in the insert in your bulletin. You can also contact Christina Norville for more information. Also in your bulletin, you're going to see a bright yellow sheet. And on that is a list of all of the various studies and Bible studies that we have coming up this fall. Take a look at that and see if there's a place that you might be able to plug in. We would love to have you join a group. Finally, next Sunday is going to be a very exciting Sunday here at Wrightsville. We are going to be practicing our back to school blessings, so blessing all of our school children as they go off to a new year of school. And also, we will have Bishop Connie Shelton here with us. She is our bishop here in the North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. She's also an incredible woman, an incredible bishop, and an incredible preacher. So you will not want to miss hearing her bring the word. Now, I invite you to take a big, deep breath. And let's prepare our hearts for worship.
The starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. All right. Thank you. Now it's everybody's turn to sing with our opening song down by the riverside. It's in your bulletin. Let's all stand and sing together. before God now in prayer as we start our worship time. And as we do that, I'd like to invite you just to put your hands open on your lap as a sign of our openness to God's presence. Let's pray now together. Holy and loving God, we thank you for gathering us together today in your name. We thank you for the promise that whenever we are gathered together in your name, you are here with us. God, today... We give you with open hands all of the worries and cares that we brought with us into this place. and We trust them to your care. And God, with open hands, we are ready to receive whatever it is that you have for us in this time. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able and join together in our opening hymn number 133, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. <laughs> Please greet those around you with the peace of Christ. It is now my privilege to invite Gwen Holly to come forward to share her testimony with us. Good morning. Good morning. 
Life is constantly changing, and for me, it has been peaks and valleys, but the one constant is my faith in Jesus Christ. As I look back on my life, my prayers have always been answered, many of them not the way I wanted them to be answered and not in the timeline. I thought they should have been answered, but I can say, looking back, that I am so thankful that God did not do what I wanted, but what he wanted. We can only see the here and now, but he sees our whole life, and his plan is perfect, even when we cannot see it. Isaiah 46.10 gives me comfort knowing that he knows the end from the beginning. For my husband, John, and I, 22, was the year we, everything just fell into place. We were living on the peak of life. We had life mapped out the way we thought it should go. For two people in their mid-60s, we closed the year out with family and friends celebrating the holidays at our horse farm, and we started making plans for all the farm projects and trips we wanted to take in 23. Over the holiday season, my husband started having a nagging cough that just would not go away. He had several visits to the doctor, and everyone assured us that it was nothing of concern. John told them that he had smoked when he was a young man, but had not smoked in over 35 years. The doctors, again, were not concerned, but they decided that a CAT scan would need to be done to figure the cause out. On February the 5th of 23, John went to Raleigh for a CAT scan and returned home the next day. I was not the least bit concerned, so I stayed home and he went alone. When he arrived back home and what he shared with me was not what I was expecting. For me, it was a blink, a second. Our world changed forever. He was told that he had a mass in his lower left lung with the lower left lung. With help from a friend who is a patient navigator at UNC Rex Cancer Center in Raleigh, we immediately went to meet with a surgeon. In that meeting, we were told that John had stage four metastatic lung cancer that had spread to his lower spine, lymph nodes, and that surgery was not an option. After the initial shock, my mind and my heart both said to me, God's got this. From one of my favorite authors and minister, the late Dr. Charles Stanley, he has taught me that there are many promises from God, and one of them that has helped me through my life is, when you fight your battles on your knees, you win every time. Though my, through my life, God has sent me to my knees many times, but I have always felt that he was asking something of me, and often it was outside of my level of comfort. It was a time of testing my faith and trusting in him. We learn in the Bible that God wants us to become more like him in our faith walk. Psalms 3, 5, 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. This Bible verse has been one that has always been there for me, no matter, and one that I have shared with others when they needed comfort and assurance. I was raised in a Christian family. I went to Bible school, youth camp, every summer. I was baptized at the age of 12, and my Christian walk was a priority until my 30s, when I placed God on the back burner. He stayed there longer than I want to admit, and after a lot of ups and downs because I was doing it my way, I realized that life was not what I wanted it to be and not what God wanted it to be. So with a little nudge from God, I started searching for the right church here in Wilmington. At that time of my life, I lived on Wrightsville Beach and had passed Wrightsville United Methodist daily. So it was a logical place to start, and I immediately felt God's presence. He took my heart and said, this is where I need you to grow in your Christ-like walk. After being a weekly visitor for a few months, I became a member in 1998. I immediately wanted to be an active member of our church family, so I learned how to be involved, and there's been no turning back. God's requirement of us to share our talent, our time, and our tithe is our way of serving him. He requires us to serve in some capacity. 
but I have found that we are the ones that are rewarded. The support that I have been given through the years and the friendships that have been built and nurtured at Wrightsville are like no other. These past few months, my husband and I both have felt much love and support in his fight against lung cancer. The outpouring of phone calls, notes, cards, and text messages have meant so much to both of us. The caring conversations, the offers to drive him back and forth to treatment, even to help do chores at the farm are remarkable. Our church talks the talk, but you walk the walk. Members of this church that have battled other life challenges have reached out and given us both sound advice, love and support in so many ways. The prayer list and the prayers that everyone have offered have made a difference. We can report that John's tumor has shrunk more than half of the original size and the oncologist is very optimistic and how well he is doing. The power of prayer does work. He is living proof. I would like to close with a quote from minister and best-selling author Max Licato from his book, Unshakable Hope. We are building our lives on the promises of God because his word is unbreakable. Our hope is unshakable. We do not stand on the problems of life or the pain of life we stand on the great and precious promises of God. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen, for sharing that. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way in the middle of the air. The big wheel run by faith and the little wheel run by the grace of God. A wheel within a wheel way in the middle of the air. But in mind, my sister, how you walk on the cross way in the middle of the air. Your foot might slip and your soul gets lost way in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way in the middle of the air, Ezekiel saw the wheel, way in the middle of the air. The big wheel run by faith, and the little wheel run by the grace of God. A wheel within a wheel, way in the middle of the air. But am I, my brother, what a hypocrite will do, way in the middle of the air. He'll low rate me and he'll low rate you, way in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel, way up in the middle of the air, Ezekiel saw the wheel. Way in the middle of the air, the big wheel run by faith, and the little wheel run by the grace of God. A wheel within a wheel, way in the middle of the air, way in the middle of the air, way in the middle of the air. Thank you. Good morning, church. I'm Eun Soo Kang, one of the associate pastors here. It is a great joy to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Loving God, what a blessing it is to come together in this community of faith. We travel here from all walks of life, spanning different ages and stages, and we are welcomed in your love and your presence. We are truly grateful for this. Holy God, it is a privilege and an honor to be chosen by you. We pray that you will continue to guide us in walking in the grace that is already bestowed upon us. With your help, we will forever remain in your marvelous light as light will always overcome darkness. We will not go back to our past. Help us to grow. Help us to move forward and radiate your light into the world. Lord, we are thankful for your blessings in our life. We bring to you the situations of celebration. It reminds us of the goodness that there is in our life. Breathe your spirit into this wonderful event 
that all who gather may rejoice and celebrate the blessings you have given each of us. Also, we pray for those who are struggling with loss, with illness, with depression, with addiction, with isolation from those that they love. We especially pray for these whom we now name with our voices or in our heart. Lord, be with each of them. Lay your hand of healing gently over their lives and pour out your balm of peace on them. Help us to be of service to each other in your holy name. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we have time to offer our hearts and gifts, I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our tithe and offerings. <laughs> When God dips his pen of love in my heart And he writes my soul a message he wants me to know His spirit all divine fills a sinful soul of mine When God dips his love in my heart well, I said I wouldn't tell it to a living soul How he brought salvation and it made me whole, but I found I couldn't hide such love as Jesus did impart. Well, he made me laugh and he made me cry. I am a sinful soul on fire. Hallelujah. When God dips his love in my heart. Well, sometimes though the way is dreary, dark, and cold, and some unburdened sorrow keeps me from the goal. I go to God in prayer. I can always find him there to whisper sweet peace to my soul. Well, I said I wouldn't tell it to a living soul how he brought salvation and he made me whole. But I found I couldn't hide such love as Jesus did impart. Well, he made me laugh and he made me cry. Hallelujah, when God dips his love in my heart. He walked up every step of Calvary's rugged way, and he gave his life completely to bring a better day. My life was steeped in sin, but in love he took me in. His blood washed away. I couldn't hide such love as Jesus did impart. Well, he made me laugh and he made me cry. I'm a sinful soul on fire. Hallelujah. When God dips his love in my heart. Hallelujah. When God dips his love, his love in my heart. Well, we come to a special time in our service today. Uh, next week, we are going to be blessing our kids as they go off to school. But today, we are recognizing all of our educators. 
So um, if you are a teacher, if you are a professor, if you are an administrator, um, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you work in education in any way, would you please raise your hand? We have something we want to give you. Awesome. OK, we've got a couple here. Um, as people are going around, um, I just want to say thank you so much to all of you. We know that truly you are being God's hands and feet in the world as you go out and do this work. Um, we also know that this can be really hard work um, when you feel like you don't have the resources that you need or um, when there's difficult external obligations and stressors that are coming on to you. Um, but this is just our little encouragement as a way of saying that um, you matter and we know that what you're doing is ministry and so God is going to go with you. So um, one more time, can I have those people who are educators raise their hands? Real high, thank you, thank you. Um, and now I'm gonna invite everyone to just extend a hand towards one of those people with their hands raised um, as we say a blessing for them. Okay, great, let's, let's bless our friends. As you begin a new year, may God go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to care for the things left undone. Go above you to protect you and your students. Go beneath you when you are worn out and ready to quit. Go beside you as a coworker and friend and dwell within you to remind you that you are never alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Let's give all of our educators a hand. It is time for a children's message. If there are any kids, welcome to join here. And great, please come here. Today. Good. good. Wow, good. Okay, um, I'm Pastor Eunsu, and I'm so happy to have this time together this morning. So, today I thought we would build something. So, I brought this block. So, let's see if we can build a tower. So, I'm going to start with um, white wine. And which color do you want to have next one? Yellow, okay, good. So next one is yellow. And white, yeah, we have white one here. Yes, here, good. And what color do you wanna have next one? Orange, orange, okay. Oh, I want it orange. And which one next? Green. Green. Good, and the last one is yeah. red, good, and oh, please, I did it, and then we did it, okay, good, now we have a colorful and this beautiful tower, okay, and this block, this white one, is what we we'll call the cornerstone, so this white cornerstone block holds all the other blocks up. But what do you think would happen to this tower if I pull out this cornerstone? Yeah, right, it would fall down. But I'm so curious if it really happens. So I'm gonna just do that. Three, two, one. Oh, yeah, our tower surely went down. So it can't stand if I pull out this cornerstone, right? Okay, so now what if this tower means our faith? And what do you think the cornerstone of our faith? Can I give you some hints? Jean. 
Jesus, yes. Wow, you're so smart. Yes, Jesus. So the cornerstone of our faith is Jesus. So I have this block name, Jesus. Yes. So in the Bible, the first Peter chapter 2, the Peter says, just like we are using this cornerstone, this white block as a cornerstone to build um, our tower, God gives us a cornerstone. The name is Jesus. Yes. And Jesus is like the most important block that holds everything in our faith. And Jesus teaches us how to love and how to care each other. So based on Jesus, According to his teaching, we can go with goodness. goodness. And then we can go with joy. joy. And then we can go with gentleness. Right. And then we can go, we can go with the last one is love. Love, love. yes. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, uh, yeah, our faith probably will fall down, but, <laughs> but, but we believe we can start again. We can start again because, we you know, Jesus promised he is always be with us so that we can have a wonderful tower and we can start again, like with goodness, with joy, and with gentleness. Okay, let's start in Jesus and joy. Goodness and gentleness. Please, gentleness, be gentle. And the last one is? Yeah, we did it. Yeah, wow. And please remember, actually, Jesus helped us grow in faith, okay? So please um, join me in prayer and let's thank to him for that. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for being with us all the time. We know that you are the cornerstone of our faith. So please keep us aware of you are very important to all of us. And help us grow in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me. Come back to your seat. Thank you, Pastor and Sue, for teaching us that Jesus is indeed the cornerstone of our faith. Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our scripture passage has been found throughout the summer in an insert in your bulletin, and you can just pull that out. It's a green insert today. We're going to be reading from 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter writes, Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This honor, then, is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
Holy and loving God, thank you for choosing us as a people. And now may the words of my mouth and all the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. First sermon I ever preached was on Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission over at Chestnut Ridge United Methodist Church in the spring of 1996. I was working at the time at Camp Chestnut Ridge in Eflin, North Carolina, right beside the tiny church, and they were um, gracious enough to give me the opportunity to preach there before I became a student pastor and went off to Duke Divinity School. The second sermon I ever preached was just a few weeks later. I'm going to do this through every sermon I've ever done. I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) The second sermon I ever preached was just a few weeks later at a church in Mebbin, and it was on today's text from 1 Peter. I do still have a copy of that sermon, but I promise I won't preach it to you today. But you want to hear something odd? Years later, I mean like 20 years later, I ran into a woman from that church in Mebbin where I preached my second sermon ever, and she still had the bulletin from that day. How weird is that? I couldn't believe it. It was so cool and so bizarre. But it kind of matches up with what St. Peter says today about the early Christian church. He calls them a peculiar people. The dictionary definition of peculiar says out of the ordinary, strange, odd, unusual. You might say just plain weird. Of course, odd or out of the ordinary all depends on what you consider normal. In Lord of the Rings, Sam and Frodo are amazed to discover that their traveling companions have never heard of second breakfast. And in the world of Hogwarts, what is odd for muggles is perfectly normal for Harry Potter, right? But the dictionary also offers a more positive spin on the word peculiar. It can also mean special, particular distinctive, belonging to one thing and not another. And I think that's the definition that Peter has in mind when he says that Christians are a peculiar people. Let's look at some of the connecting images that Peter uses to define the early Christian church. In addition to calling us a peculiar people, he also calls us a royal priesthood, a holy nation with a particular task. And by digging into these phrases, we might understand better who we are supposed to be today as a church. Number one, we are a holy nation. Now, right off the bat, it's obvious Peter is not talking about political citizenship in the nation or state. He's not advocating for the divine right of kings or for manifest destiny. Nor is he suggesting that one political nation or state is somehow more holy than another. He is, after all, writing in the day when the Roman Empire was in full force, literally covering and controlling the known world. The worship of Caesar and of the state was simply part of the woodwork, the full melding of religion and state. The creed of the nation was Caesar is Lord, and they really believed that their nation was holy and that Caesar was divine. Peter is not talking about that kind of national allegiance, or citizenship at all. Rather, Peter is writing to this fledgling band of scattered disciples who, in the face of the might of Rome and the worship of Caesar, dare to say, Jesus is Lord. These are the ones he's calling a holy nation, called out from every nation, every tribe, every language under God, marked by the sign of the cross, traveling under the banner of allegiance to Christ as Lord of all. You, says Peter, because you belong to one thing and not another. Because you worship God alone and not the state. Because your first allegiance is to the cross rather than any standard sign or flag. You are a holy nation. God's own. Now, the problem of misunderstanding what it means to be a holy nation goes right back to the beginning with God's original call to the children of Abraham, you know, the Old Testament people of Israel. 
Early on in Hebrew history, the people were beginning to think that, well, they were kind of special. And we can start to believe that it's all about our goodness and our identity and who we are that makes the difference. So as early as the book of Deuteronomy, Moses uses the same language and image that Peter now declares in his letter to the Christians. Moses says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, it's not because you're more numerous that the Lord set his love upon you and chose you, but it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath which he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you. Deuteronomy 7. See, it's not because you're so special, but because God is special and loves you. It's not because you're so holy, but because God is holy and has redeemed you. It's not because there's something intrinsically better about your state than any other, but because God has claimed you and made you his own. You, as the people of God, from every nation and every tribe, you are a holy nation, God's own people. Peter Story, the former bishop of the Methodist Church of South Africa and one of my professors at Duke Divinity School, led the South African Methodist Church through the difficult and challenging days of their witness against the evils of apartheid. In a sermon back in 1989, before the liberation of his nation, he said, in South Africa, the pagan notion of racial purity and pride has become our nation's God and that sick, false religion stains everything we do. One of the great tragedies of my homeland is that some parts of the Christian church have become mouthpieces, not of God, but of the state. It's time for the church to be the church. You see, Jesus brought into being an entirely new, radically different community, offering people citizenship, transcending the frontiers of nations, and contrasting powerfully with the norms around it. This alternative identity must be cherished as the most important characteristic of the church, that our identity is in Jesus Christ. Of course, Bishop Story's right. The church needs to be clear about our identity. Our highest allegiance is always to Christ. We belong to one thing and not another. We are gathered from all the peoples of the earth as the body of Christ, as the kingdom of God, as a holy nation, regardless of any kind of national boundary. It makes us a bit peculiar, distinctive, special, particular. We are God's own people. And secondly, we are a royal priesthood. Now that word royal might get you to thinking of the priesthood as an order of princes in the church, elevated, holy, robed in silver and gilded with gold, better than everybody else. But nothing could be further from the truth in the mind of Peter or in the pattern of Christ. You see, to be a priest is to be one who goes between God and the people. It is to be one who communicates the word of God to the world. It's to be commissioned with the task of carrying out the ministry of Christ into the community. To be the ones who break the bread of reconciliation and bear the cup of God's mercy to those who are hurting the most. And Peter's letter is not addressed to some set-apart class of ordained clergy since none actually existed in the church at the time of his writing. Now, I happen to believe in the role of the ordained. I'm an ordained pastor and have been serving for 27 years. But Peter's letter is addressed to all the church. He says, you all are a royal priesthood. All are called to go between God and the world. All are called to carry the love of God into the world. All are called to be servant people of God. All are called to be priests to one another. In contrast to the priests of the pagan temples around them, where these people were venerated and pampered and completely out of touch 
with the common people. Peter calls the whole church to the task of servanthood, to the calling of Christ. Several years ago, when British Airways was doing really well, Dick Georgiatis was credited for turning British Airways into the most profitable airline in the world. When asked the secret of his success, Dick said, well, it's really quite simple. We just turned our management philosophy completely upside down, and everyone became accountable to the person below them instead of the person above them. So here's this massive corporation embracing the servant lifestyle of Jesus. The focus of the company would be on the humble passenger instead of the top executive. Well, who's the focus in the church? Who is the person we are concerned about? Who do we exist to serve? Well, for Jesus, there's no question. In the kingdom, the humble are lifted up, and the most vulnerable have a special place. Jesus says the final judgment will be on what you do for the least of these. We're called to be a royal priesthood in service to the world. Indeed, a peculiar people, a holy nation. Which brings us to point three. We have a particular task. To declare the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. I love that phrase. You've got to kind of take a deep breath because there are no commons or there are no semicolons. To declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There are three clauses in that. It's quite a commission, quite a calling, quite a task to declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Just imagine what it would be like to start every morning looking in the mirror, saying to yourself that no matter what happens today, no matter what I have to do, my first task is to declare the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. No matter how boring the meetings are I'm going to go to today, no matter how dull the duties I have to do, my hidden agenda is going to be to declare the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. No matter how depressing the headlines, no matter how uncertain the future, my calling today is to what? It's to declare the wonderful deeds of him who calls us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. When John Wesley sent lay preacher George Shadford to the American colonies with nothing in his saddlebag but his Bible and his hymnal, he sent him with this commission. He said, I set you loose, George, on the great continent of America. Proclaim your message in the open face of the sun and do all the good you can. Those early circuit riders were given a charge to proclaim scriptural holiness and reform the continent. And they went about doing just that. You see, they knew they were peculiar, special, distinctive, commissioned with the task of proclaiming the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. One quick story. Some of you may recall that in the winter of 2019, I went with our former associate pastor, Edie Gleaves, to the country of Sierra Leone to celebrate the work that our church was doing there at a hospital in the town of Rotofunk. Sierra Leone is in the bottom 10 of countries around the world for average life expectancy. It is next to last in per capita income, and it's absolutely last when it comes to the infant mortality rate or the number of babies who do not survive to see their first birthday. Visiting there is eye-opening and intense. Thousands upon thousands of people live in homes with tin roofs and dirt floors with no running water and no electricity. It is tough, and it is really tough by American standards. But the United Methodist Church is thriving there. The church has started dozens of schools and several hospitals, including the one we work with in Rotofunk. They've started an initiative to teach people how to improve farming techniques so that more food will be available to the people of the country. The United Women of Faith built a bakery this past spring that will employ women and help them to become self-reliant. 
At the bakery, the women have been trained in management skills, bookkeeping, marketing, customer service, and more. The church has started a prison ministry that works with youth in juvenile detention to help transform their lives and give them a future with hope. It's amazing to see the impact of the United Methodist Church on this small but struggling part of West Africa. So I'm there in 2019 with Edie, and our friend and church member Dale Smith flies over later to meet us there. We're to be guests of the bishop of the United Methodist Church's annual conference in Sierra Leone. But let me tell you how their conference starts. It's so cool. Hundreds upon hundreds of Methodists come to the capital of Freetown from all over the country, just like our annual conference delegates meet in Greenville each year. But in Sierra Leone, they block off the main street and have a parade from the conference headquarters to the church that's hosting the annual conference. It's probably about two miles. Everyone dresses up in their finest clothes, and they sing and dance as drummers and brass players lead the procession through the very busy city of Freetown. It is such a celebration. For there in the midst of all this poverty and pain, in the midst of so much darkness and death, there is this group of people who march through the streets declaring the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. It is odd. It is strange. It is out of the ordinary. It is special. It's distinctive. It's peculiar. Belonging to one thing and not another. You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's own people. How can you declare the wonderful deeds of him who calls us out of darkness and into his marvelous light? For that's who we are, and that's what we're called to do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you that you have called us out of darkness. You have given us a new life where you have redeemed us through Jesus Christ. And you sustain us every day with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that as you have poured out your gifts upon us, that you will give us courage to share those gifts with the world so that others will know of your glory. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. But our closing hymn throughout camp meeting month is Glory, Hallelujah, Jubilee. You'll find the words printed in your bulletin. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn.
Thank you, Gwen, for your message today. Uh, we certainly continue to pray for you. And I think I saw Johnny back there in the back praying for you as well, Johnny. And uh, thank you to the Jewel family for uh, leading us in music as well. And um, yeah, absolutely. Let's give them all a big hand. Let's go forth to declare the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Yeah, it may be a little peculiar, but that's who we are as Christians. Go forth in the peace of Christ, now and forever. Amen.